All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. So excited about today's guest, I can barely handle it. James Clear is a New York Times bestselling author of Atomic Habits, a book that I mowed through in less than two days. It is a phenomenal, approachable way to build sustainable habits in your life. You guys have heard me talk about building your healthy foundation to your house brick by brick. James gives you the tools and resources to make that happen. You can tell that I fangirl throughout this episode because what James preaches is exactly how I work with clients to support them to change their healthy lifestyle and to really have sustainable change. And I just can't tell you how valuable Atomic Habits has been for me, for my clients, and for so many people out there. So if you haven't read the book Atomic Habits, you have to get it. I mean, go to your <laughs> go to your bookstore today, download it, do whatever it takes, um, listen to it in your car. It is truly a life changer and a game changer. And once you hear this episode, you'll know exactly why. So totally applicable tools that you can take into your life. Throughout this episode, you're going to learn how to build habits, how to break habits, and um, and just about giving yourself a little bit of grace and um, and making it happen. So super stoked to have James Clear on today's episode and um, so thankful for his time. So if you guys really want to change your life, listen in. James, thank you so much for joining the show. Like I said, uh, before we started, I devoured your book. I read it like a textbook, highlighted, listened to it, and was fist bumping in my car because so many times you said something that resonated with me personally as a nutritionist and a health coach. And it it actually explained why some of the recommendations I make for clients work so well. So I just can't thank you enough for your time and for sharing your knowledge with my audience. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk. Well, so can we start from the beginning? Can you tell me a little bit about your how you started out as a writer and how you started your business and how it's evolved to a best-selling book that's been on New York Times list for weeks and weeks? Sure. Yeah. Um, It ties in with habits fairly well, actually. So I've been an entrepreneur for over a decade. Um, The first couple of years, it was mostly me fumbling around and making a bunch of mistakes and not really knowing what I was doing. Um, But eventually, I found my footing after a year or two. And uh, I started writing at jamesclear.com in November of 2012. And I wrote a new article every Monday and Thursday for the first three years. And so it was really that writing habit that led to the growth of my audience and eventually developing an expertise around habits and ultimately writing Atomic Habits and working on the book. Um, 
after a, a few years, the audience had grown to um, a couple hundred thousand subscribers. And so I had a large enough platform that publishers were interested or a few agents would reach out and say, Hey, have you ever thought about making this into a book or writing about this in you know, some more in-depth way? And I never really started out to be an author. Uh, I was more interested in being an entrepreneur. And even honestly, until the book was finished and actually like printed and in my hands, I didn't really identify as an author. Now I like have to admit it, but <laughs> I, I usually think of myself more as an entrepreneur. And I didn't really set out to try to become better at writing either. I was just writing and building an email list because people said that was a good idea to grow the business. And along the way, yeah, I found out, oh, it turns out I actually like, kind of like writing. So I think if you had gone to like any of my teachers or professors or anything, be like, was you know, like, do you think you'd be a writer? They'd be like, probably not. Like B plus, like he's fine. But I don't think they would have <laughs> uh, said that. So I sort of stumbled into it, and uh, I signed the book deal in 2015 and spent the next three years writing it, and it came out in October of 2018, and uh, since has done quite well and sold over 2 million copies and been on the bestseller list and all that kind of stuff. So it's been, it's been a great ride, uh, a lot of fun. I have tried a variety of different business models over the last 10 years. And books are the one that resonate with me the most. I've done a bunch of other stuff, you know, speaking, online courses, uh, services, whatever, a variety of different things. But books feel like they're in my wheelhouse. I, I like putting them together. I like sharing them. I feel like I'm good at doing it. Um, I like spending time on something that is uh, that persists that's like an artifact that's gonna you know you can come back to it in 10 years or 20 years so there are a lot of things that I, I really like about it but it, it took me a while to find the right avenue for me and I think books are it I mean you simplify and make I mean in this in, in atomic habits you're making habits accessible to people at a price point that they can go out and change their life immediately and like you said it can be around forever and continually be printed people can get their hands on it and literally literally change their life so I'm so excited that you're an author I'm so excited that you put this book out I think building habits, foundationally brick by brick to create that like wellness lifestyle that so many of my clients want to have is really the sweet spot and the special sauce for getting consistent. And so I'd love for you to explain, you know, how long does it take or in your words, how many does it take <laughs> to build a, a habit and and what's happening in the brain so that we can make it automatic. Yeah. So I, I like that phrase you used brick by brick. It, you know, I chose the phrase atomic habits for a couple of reasons. I mean, the first meaning of the word atomic is tiny or small. And I do think your habits should be, you know, small and easy to do, like an atom. But the second meaning, and one that people often overlook, is the fundamental unit in a larger system. So the same way that you have like this brick by brick building up to, you know, a wall or a building or whatever. You know, atoms build on top of each other to create molecules, molecules create compounds, and so on. And so each of your habits is like a little atom in that system, like a little brick in the overall building. And the more that you stack those together and pile them up, uh, you can end up building something uh, quite impressive in the long run. And then the third and final meaning is the source of immense energy or power. And I think if you combine all three of those meanings, you sort of understand the narrative arc of the book, which is you make small changes that are small and easy to do build them on top of each other like units in a larger system and you can end up with these impressive or remarkable results. And people like that idea, but you know, one of the first questions they ask is what you just asked, which is well how long does it take? How long do I have to be doing this for? And you see all kinds of things, you know, it takes 21 days, takes 30 days, 90 days, whatever. Uh, a common one that you'll hear right now is 66 days because there was uh, one study that found that on average it took about 66 days to build a habit. The honest answer is obvious as soon as you say it, which is it depends. You know, if you pick something really easy, like having a glass of water at lunch each day, maybe it's only a few weeks. If you pick something much harder, like going for a run every day after work, maybe that's a couple months. And the same habit can be wildly different depending on the environment you're in. You know, like if you're trying to go for a run every day and you live with a bunch of roommates who are also athletic and into running, then that's much easier than if you're, you know, nobody in your family is into working out. So, there are a lot of different variables there. I don't think there is any one number. But I think the true answer, the honest answer to how long does it take to build a habit is forever. Because if you <laughs> stop doing it, it's no longer a habit, right? Like it, it's, and this I think speaks to why you're looking for a small change, a non threatening change, a sustainable change. 
habits are not a finish line to be crossed. They're like a lifestyle to be lived. And so you're really looking for something you can integrate into your new lifestyle. You know, as you referenced, I often think it's more useful to think about habits in terms of the number of reps that you've put in rather than the amount of time that's elapsed. You can just think about, you know, some of our habits form so readily, so quickly. Like, uh, what was the first time you got a smartphone? Like, how long did it take you to get in the habit of checking your phone? Most of us don't even remember. It was probably 48 hours or something. I mean, it's just you, once you check it so many times, um, you're just doing it implicitly and automatically. So, habits are, there is nothing magical about 30 days passing, for example. It's like, how many times have you done it in that 30 days? And how, strongly do you feel about it? You know, how, how strong of a reward is there, a positive emotion associated with it? And the more reps you put in and the more positively you feel about the experience, the faster the habit will form. I love it. Well, you just sort of touched on it, which was the reward. In your book, you go through you know, what creates that habit, the cue, the craving, the response, and the reward. Can you talk through that arc so that people understand how these habits are formed and how we get behavioral change? Yeah. So let me, I'll do uh, the scientific description and then we'll do the practical and actionable description. So the scientific description, I like to divide a habit into four different stages. And as you said, they're cue, craving, response, and reward. So the cue is something that gets your attention, something that you notice. So like you're driving down the road and you hear an ambulance come up from behind you. That The siren is like an auditory cue that starts the habit of pulling to the side of the road. Or you walk into the kitchen and you see a plate of cookies on the counter. That's a visual cue that starts the habit of eating a cookie. All right. So then after the cue, the next thing that happens, and often this is like almost automatic, you don't even really think about it your brain makes a prediction about what that cue means. And that's what I'm calling the craving. So sometimes we use the word craving, like I'm craving a donut or I'm craving a cigarette or something like that. But it's happening even if it's not like a conscious craving. Like for example, you might walk in, see that plate of cookies on the counter, visual cue, and then your brain predicts, oh, those will be sweet, sugary, tasty, enjoyable. And it's actually that prediction, that craving that motivates you to take the third step, which is you walk over and take a bite. So the response is the actual habit you perform. And then the fourth and final stage is the reward. And oh, it is in fact sweet, sugary, tasty, enjoyable. And so the reward sort of... It satisfies the craving that came before uh, the action. And it also closes the feedback loop. So you can sort of imagine those four steps as this like little loop that you go through. You see the cookies, you predict they'll be tasty, you take a bite, they are tasty. And the more that you go around that loop, the more that reward signals to your brain, hey, next time you see a cookie, do the same thing. That turns out favorably for you. And uh, eventually, if you go around the loop enough times, it becomes more or less automatic and mindless. And so that's kind of the scientific description of what a habit is. I do want to add one little thing, which I feel like is an important point. At this point, a lot of people say, okay, but what, what about my bad habits? You're telling me my bad habits are rewarding? Like, If I know this is bad, why do I keep doing it? And the way that I would define it is that pretty much all behaviors produce multiple outcomes across time. So broadly speaking, there's an immediate outcome and there's an ultimate outcome. And for your bad habits, the immediate outcome is actually often quite favorable. Like the immediate outcome of eating a donut is great. It's sweet and sugary and tasty. It's only the ultimate outcome that's unfavorable. Or even something like smoking a cigarette. The immediate outcome of smoking a cigarette might be you get to socialize with friends outside the office or you curb your nicotine craving. It's only 2 or 5 or 10 years later that the ultimate outcome is unfavorable. But with your good habits, it's often the reverse. Like the immediate outcome of going to the gym for the first week is kind of unfavorable. Your body looks the same in the mirror. The scale hasn't really (laughs) changed. If anything, you're like sore. Um, It's only the ultimate outcome that's favorable. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you feel like you're going to throw up. Um, so it's really um, that gap between the immediate outcome and the ultimate outcome. I think that helps explain why bad habits stick, even if they don't ultimately serve us. And it also helps clarify like the difference between a good and a bad habit. I would say the difference is the cost of your good habits is in the present. The cost of your bad habits is in the future. And so I would say good habits are the ones that tend to serve us in the long run. Okay, so that's the scientific description of a habit. Cue, craving, response, reward. We got those four stages. If we want to make it actionable, if we want to be able to like apply this to our daily life in a practical way, then 
I've developed what I call the four laws behavior change. And there's one for each step. So for the cue, the first law is to make it obvious. You want the cues of your good habits to be obvious, available, visible, easy to see. The easier it is for you to get your attention, more likely you are to stick to the habit. The second law is to make it attractive. The more attractive or appealing a habit is, the more likely you are to feel motivated to do it. The third law is to make it easy. The easier, more convenient, frictionless, simple a habit is, the more likely it is to stick. And then the fourth law is to make it satisfying. The more satisfying or enjoyable or pleasurable a habit is, the more you have this kind of positive emotional signal that says, hey, do this again next time. So those four stages, cue, craving, response, reward, make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. That gives you like a nice high level framework for what a habit is and also like how you can adjust each of those stages to get it to better serve you. I love it because what you've done is taken the little tips that I've given clients over the years and given me the science behind it. I mean, I'm sitting here, we're having this podcast interview. I have my 40 ounce Yeti with me. And this is something that I recommend to my clients to do to drink more water. It's like, Make it obvious. The Yeti goes on the counter next to your water filter. You fill it up in the morning. Make it attractive. It's like, hey, if you want to add some electrolyte powder to it, it makes it a little bit tasty, whatever. It's out. It's easy. And it's sitting on my desk. It's satisfying. It's easy for me to drink it. And then all of a sudden, I go from not drinking any water, my client's not drinking any water throughout the day, to filling this up two or three times. And it's an easy automatic habit. So it's, it's surprising how little changes like that just haven't... You're essentially priming the environment for a more productive action. And it's surprising how much that can work, how, how simple it is, and yet it still works. Um, so in this case, you know, you're know you just filling the water bottle up, you're making it obvious, you're having it in the environment, you're making it easy to do, it's right next to you. But you can also do the opposite. Like I've noticed the two, one, two that I've noticed, for example, um, if I buy a six pack of beer, and I put it in the front of the fridge where I can see it as soon as I open the door up. I'll have a I'll have one every night just because it's there. But if I take it and stuff it like on the bottom of the the fridge, like lowest shelf, kind of all the way in the back where I can't really see it unless I like bend down. Sometimes it'll sit there for weeks, uh, and I'll like forget that I bought it. And I'm always like, well, did I want it or not? You know, like on the one hand, I wanted it when it was right in front of me, but on the other hand, I never wanted it bad enough to actually like seek it out. And it's surprising how many of your bad habits can fade away like that if you just do the opposite of what I what I just recommended for the four laws. So I, I should mention that too. For building a good habit, you want to make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. For breaking a bad habit, you just do the inverse. You just do the, the opposite. So rather than making it obvious, make it invisible. Rather than making it attractive, make it unattractive. Rather than making it easy, make it difficult. Rather than making it satisfying, make it unsatisfying. And um, again, it's surprising how much you can reduce an undesirable behavior just by priming the environment in the right way. And also how much you can pick up or increase a, a good habit just by making it as easy as possible to do. To make something obvious to kind of cue and get that habit going can be simple, right? We talked about the Yeti. Another recommendation that I work with with clients is to buy the glass Pyrex, chop up and rinse their yeah, veggies. Yeah. They don't have to do meal prep. We don't have to spend six hours in the in the kitchen every week, but it's like, hey, if you open your fridge and you see those veggies that are chopped and and there, it's easy to roast them. It's easy to dip them into a dip for crudite. It's there. It's obvious, right? I think the breaking the habit is really what I'd love you to like break down even further because I think it's easy to make your beer invisible in the back of your fridge. But how do we make those things... Like I'm married to a, a man whose Instagram is Be Bad by Chris. He's trolling me on the internet. He loves beer. He loves fried foods. How do I make those things unattractive to him um, and unsatisfying? Because you talked about you know that craving and that reward. Well, a beer, when you crack it open, yum, right? And then all of a sudden, you're feeling awesome, chill. It's a, you're watching NFL. Your, your fantasy team's going. I'm just... As a wife, I'm looking for ways to make it unattractive and make it unsatisfying so that people can start to break those bad habits. Yeah, it's a great question. I'll let me say a couple of different things. Um, so first, I feel like usually if I'm going to recommend a place for people to start with breaking a bad habit, I recommend either the first law or the third law. So in this case, it's the inversion of those. So make it invisible instead of making it obvious, or make it difficult instead of making it easy. 
And uh, to apply that to habits often looks like this, like for making it invisible, you're trying to reduce exposure to the queue. So this could be something like my example of keeping beer tucked on a different shelf. A more extreme version would be not having beer in the house at all. And so by reducing the exposure to the queue, people often reduce the behavior. In other examples of habits, something not related to eating, like let's say you're spending too much money on clothes and online shopping. Well, unsubscribe from those emails. Don't like you know. Don't get every Nordstrom's every sale email, or don't get um, you know. Don't be following style bloggers on Instagram or whatever. Like you're constantly being triggered to do the thing you're trying to avoid. So, uh, the other thing that you could do is making it difficult instead of making it easy. And this is more about increasing friction and adding steps between you and the desired behavior. So. You know, uh, let's see. Like, if you if you bought beer that had, um, it's not a twist off top. It has to be um, popped with a bottle opener. But then you don't have a bottle opener in the house. That's a lot of friction between. Like, you have the object, you want to do it, but it's much harder to do. So there are a variety of ways to increase friction. Some of them are really small. Like, let's say a lot of people feel like they watch too much television. But walk into any living room in America, where do all the couches and chairs face? You know, it's like, what is this room designed to get you to do? It's the most obvious, easy action there. So if you want to increase the friction of that, you could, for example, take the TV and put it inside a wall unit or a cabinet so it's behind doors so you're less likely to see it. You could unplug the TV after each use so that you're... And then only plug it back in if you can like say the name of the show that you want to watch. So you can't just like turn on mindlessly and find something. You could... Uh, take the remote control, put it inside a drawer, put a book in its place. Um, you could take the chair that you usually sit in, turn it away from the TV, have it face a, an end table with a book on it. And individually, none of these choices are going to radically transform your behavior, or transform your life. But collectively, you start to live and operate in an environment where the good habit is the path of least resistance. And that really... I think that's the first thing I would say. This is particularly true if you're trying to change the behavior of someone else. You know, if you're trying to change somebody else's behavior, you can't really change their motivations. You can't really change um, what they find desirable or what they find rewarding. So those second and fourth stage, the craving and the reward, you don't really have control over someone's mind. So the only other option, the best choice is to adjust the environment so that the desirable behaviors are always obvious in the path of least resistance. And the undesirable behaviors are always less obvious and higher friction. I do want to mention something else though, because I think this ultimately gets to the root of of the problem. It's possible to rewire the narrative that you have about a habit and how favorable it is or whether you want to do it or not. It's hard, or I should say it's it's hard to design it uh, to to do this, but it is possible. So let me give an example related to food. Let's say that you walk into your kitchen and you see a loaf of bread on the counter. And it's like, I don't know, 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. or something. And you're like, oh, I'll make some toast for breakfast. And so you do that. And then a week later, you read a book that convinces you that carbs are the devil and grain is terrible and you should never touch it again. And so then the next week, you go downstairs and you see the same loaf of bread. But this time, it has a different meaning. So the, the cue is the same. But instead, you tell a different story about what that bread means. And instead of thinking, I should make toast, you think, oh, I should throw that away or I shouldn't touch that or whatever. And so we could call that different things. Like we'd call it like a shift in perspective or changing your worldview or if you had an epiphany or whatever. But it happens. It's just hard to predict when it happens. And so there is a world where your husband views fantasy football as a waste of time and doesn't think that beer is really that healthy for him and doesn't want to do it anymore and would rather do a bunch of productive things. I don't know. But I don't know that you have control over changing that er narrative. (laughs) Right? Like it's, It's like, it's possible, uh, but it's hard to do. It's hard to design it. I will feel, I will say, um, so he is an attorney and a writer and he's actually copy edits my books. And so that's been the best thing for our relationship because he reads all the tips and all the science and he retains so much of it. So I know that the knowledge is in there and I know that there's that driving force too. But I like the I love that you're saying that the best ways to break a habit are one and three. Instead of trying to work on their craving and reward, we're working on making something invisible or making it difficult because instead of being an enabler and grabbing the Pliny's at at Whole Foods for, you know, Sunday football, I cannot buy that and make it invisible. 
So that's that's a great tip. I think another example, like let's say, um, I heard this one from a reader. I thought it was clever, which is like take biting your nails. For a lot of people, that's like a habit that's so mindless and automatic and quick. And like your hands are always there. So they're never not going to be obvious. But the way that they did it was they got Invisalign. And so they couldn't bite their nails when they had the liners on their teeth. Mm -hmm. And that's a good example of increasing friction. And so suddenly it just wasn't possible to do. And so they had to find a different, you know, substitute or outlet for that energy or stress or whatever it was. So that's another example of what it might look like to make it difficult for a habit. There are a bunch of examples in the book too, but I'm, I'm just trying to think of ones that are applied to you know, your own personal health. No, it's great. Um, well, let's go, let's go into determining whether a habit is a good habit or a bad habit because you have an amazing tool called the Habit Scorecard that I'd love for you to explain. So we kind of this, this kind of ties in with what I was just mentioning about having a mindset shift or changing your worldview and how it's possible, but it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to design. The same thing is true for your habits and behavior in general. So one of the most common myths about behavior change is that change is hard and, you know, like it's very difficult to do something new or to build a new habit. The truth is you're changing all the time. Um, One of the primary functions of your brain is to change your behavior based on the environment that you're in or based on the context that you're around. And what I would say the caveat is, is that you're changing all the time. The question is just, are you in control of the change or not? Or are you simply changing without realizing it or without being aware of it? And so the process of like strategic behavior change, the process of conscious improvement almost always starts with self-awareness. It almost always starts with understanding your current habits better and understanding what you're doing and how you're doing it and whether it's serving you. And so the habit scorecard is an exercise that tries to get at that. Um, it says, it's very simple. You just list out all of the habits that you can think of that you do when you go throughout your day. So you might start with the time you wake up and you say, I turn off my alarm. I get out of bed and take a shower. I step on the scale. I brush my teeth. I get dressed. I, you know, just go through your whole, uh, your whole daily routine in as much detail as you'd like. And then you assign a score to each one of those habits, either a plus sign if it's a positive thing and you feel like it serves you in the long run. A minus sign if you feel like it's negative and doesn't really serve you well. And then you can just put an equal sign next to it if it's like fairly neutral and doesn't really matter too much one way or another. And the thing that I feel like is useful about the habit scorecard is that it reveals what you're already doing and just makes you aware of those things that were previously mindless. And if you want to change a habit, whether it's breaking a bad one or inserting a new one, you got to be aware of what you're doing already. And there are a variety of other things that kind of cascade out of this or unfold from this exercise. It's not just increased self-awareness. The other thing is that if you do have a new habit that you want to build, understanding where your current habits stand helps make it easier for you to find a place for that new habit to live in your routine. Like you start to identify, oh, maybe this is the best place to insert that new behavior. Maybe I should wait, you know, six hours and do it in the evening or whatever. So it's, uh, it's helpful in a variety of different ways. But the number one thing is it just increases self-awareness and understanding. And then when you look at your habit scorecard and you start to see these positive habits and you start to see your negative habits, what's the first step? Are we neutralizing or replacing those negative habits? Or are we stacking up our our positive habits? Like, What's your recommendation when it comes to change? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it can be very personal. You know, it doesn't really matter too much if you, uh, as long as you're making progress and making a positive change, you know, like you may, something may jump out at you. And I would say if you feel inspired to change that thing, then you should probably do that thing. If you're looking for a general recommendation, I usually prefer to focus on building good habits rather than breaking bad ones. And the reason is that building a good habit can often crowd out a bad one, sort of like one plant crowding out another in a forest. So let's say, for example, that you have a bad habit of uh, you feel like you watch too much TV or you turn on Netflix automatically every night at 7 p.m. And you have a good habit that you want to build, which is you want to start working out more consistently. Well, on the one hand, like working out and television don't really seem that related. But if you just focus on building a workout routine after your, uh, your day has ended and you're at the gym at 7 p.m., by definition, you're not watching Netflix then. So you have already kind of eaten up some of that bad habit just by focusing on building the good one. 
And so I think that can happen a lot of the time. So my general recommendation is start with focusing on the good ones. But you know, if you feel particularly inspired to break a bad one, that's fine too. No, I love it. I always I, I love when my clients replace instead of focusing on removing something. It's like uh, soda there's, might be um, the example. There's three ways to break a bad habit. The the first one is to reduce the behavior so you can like curtail it to the desired degree. Um, so for example, I have this habit where I try to leave my phone in another room until lunch each day. Now, I'm not breaking the, ba- the habit of checking my phone entirely. I still use it. But for those few hours, it's not around me. And so it's easier for me to do the things that I want to do. And that um, reduces it to the desired level. The second option is you can eliminate it. You can try to cut it out entirely. And that can work. Um, but it's... Uh, it's rare that someone's just like go cold turkey and just like just don't do that basically is what the advice is. It can work. There's some other strategic things you may need to do like changing the environment or changing the social environment or things like that. And then the third and final one is substitute uh, a good behavior for a bad one. And that's what we're talking about here. And uh, in many cases, that's the most effective method. And so yeah, by focusing on building a good one, you often kind of implicitly substitute it for some of the bad behaviors that you were spending that time on previously. I love it. Yeah, I think well, when it comes to like soda, for example, I might swap someone to a Zevia and then to a LaCroix and then to a sparkling water with a squeeze of lemon. And it's not like you're never mm. going to have soda again because I feel like the minute you tell someone that, they're like, give me all the soda. <laughs> but instead, you're like, try this, see if it works. And if you're not as emotionally connected to it, but you still are kind of checking the box of that craving and reward, then it works, right? Yeah. Um, I even like... Um using a good habit as a way to just delay the bad one. So like in the soda example, you could say, listen, if you want to have a Coke, that's fine. You're allowed to have it, but you just have to have a glass of, glass of water first. And a lot of the time people drink the glass of water and then they're like, oh, actually... And this, I think, actually, this is a... You're kind of un- unpacking or hinting at a, an even deeper thing about habits and behavior change, which is that people often don't necessarily want to do the bad habit. What they really want is what the habit provides them, which is a change in state. So they they don't necessarily want to eat Doritos or to smoke a cigarette or to drink a Coke. What they want is to feel different. And um, it's those behaviors that allow them to feel differently. And if you can find something else, a different behavior that allows you to feel a different way, you often don't need that other pathway to change your state. One of the examples I always think of from my own life, I was on vacation with my family and uh, we had just had a long day and we got back to the hotel and we were like, hey, let's um, order some pizza. And so they called the pizza in and in, I was starving. I was like ready to pound like you know multiple <laughs> boxes myself. And in, in between, the time between when we placed the order and when the pizza arrived, I was like, you know what? I'll just like do a short workout. Like I'm just going to do some push-ups and stuff. And I did that. And by the time I got done with the workout, I wasn't hungry anymore. And I was like, that's so interesting. I thought that what I wanted was pizza, but really all I wanted was to just feel differently. And by doing the workout, I felt differently. And then I didn't have the craving. And so there are a lot of things that are like that. And um, I think one of the challenges of habits and behavior change is that when you're a kid, throughout your childhood, you inherit a lot of your habits. You soak up the behaviors of people around you and the strategies and solutions that they've used to feel differently. And so you think that's the pathway to changing how I feel in a given moment. But as you become an adult, it becomes your responsibility to realize that actually there are many ways to change how I feel in this moment. And it's my responsibility to choose the more productive one or the healthier one or whatever. And so you kind of gradually transition from inheriting your habits to um, shaping them. And, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, that's the process of maturing into an adult. And you're giving people the tools on how to shape their habits in your book, which we are all obsessed with. So (laughs) thank you for doing that. (laughs) Habit stacking. Let's make it easy for people. What is habit stacking? How can it be a trigger for change? So... I think one of the core underlying insights here is that a lot of people feel like what they lack is motivation when what they really lack is clarity. In reality, a lot of people are perfectly capable of making change. They're just not clear about when and where a habit is going to live in their life. You kind of wake up and you think, oh, I hope I feel motivated to write today or I hope I feel motivated to work out today or whatever. And habit stacking was one way to sort of 
uh, solve that issue. So habit stacking is a, an idea that I first came across through BJ Fogg. He's a professor at Stanford. And um, he has this little formula where if you want to insert a new behavior into your life, then you stack it on top of a current habit. So for example, uh, say your current habit is you make a cup of coffee every morning. And the new habit that you want to build is you want to start meditating. Well, the habit stack would be after I make my morning cup of coffee, I will meditate for 60 seconds. And so you stack the new behavior on top of the old one. And this solves that problem that I just mentioned, which is you're very clear. You have a lot of clarity about when and where that habit's going to occur. It has like now it has a time and a space and a location in your life. And it makes it much more likely that you're going to stick with it. Now, once you start to get good at this, you can create these little stacks, these little kind of chains of habits. So you could say something like, um, all right, I'm going to come up with a morning routine. And it's going to be, after I make my cup of coffee, I will uh, meditate for 60 seconds. After I meditate for 60 seconds, I will write my to-do list for the day. After I write my to-do list for the day, I will select the most important item and begin working on it. And that little chain of three or three or four behaviors gives you a very clear habit stack for starting your day in a productive way. And I have readers who have used this kind of idea in many different ways. You know, like you can use it, um, you might have a little bundle of behaviors like that in the morning. You might have one when you get into the office. Like I have someone who says, you know, after I set my purse down on my desk, I immediately fill up my water bottle um, and take it to my, you know, my workstation or whatever. And so she does it in the same way every time she gets to the office. Or they can become like little sets of rules for you as you go throughout your day. Like you could say something like, whenever I see a set of stairs, I will take that instead of climbing onto the elevator. Or um, whenever I put food in the microwave, I will do air squats while I'm waiting for it to get ready. And things like that allow you to have these little kind of healthy rules uh, that fit into your life in, in very obvious and clear places. And so... That's sort of the idea behind habit stacking is making it as easy as possible and as obvious as possible when and where a new habit's going to live in your life. Thinking about my own personal life, I really wanted to get good at taking my supplements and I love coffee. So I'd click my coffee maker on, fill up my glass of water and that became like that little stack, that little place for me to take my supplements. It was like, I wanted to drink water before I drank coffee. I wanted to take supplements and I just slipped it in right there. And reading your book, I was like, Oh, yeah, that worked out really well for me with that water and supplement routine. And it's something that I recommend to other people now just because it's if you love coffee, and you go to turn it on, you have that little moment. So habit stacking that ties back into what you mentioned a few minutes ago, too, about the habit scorecard. Because if you could have like just written out your habits there, you've got your you are looking through your morning routine, and you say, Okay, I would like to take my vitamins and supplements more consistently, and I'd like to drink water before I drink coffee. Where should I fit this in? And you're like, oh, actually, I could do it right before, you know, right after I turn the coffee on, I can do it right then. And so by doing that scorecard, you find a good place to insert the habit stack. Uh, and so it, they, the two strategies kind of work well together. Yeah. And it's interesting because I always kept my supplements in my bathroom, but when I move them to the cabinet right above my coffee maker, that where my coffee grounds are, then I sort of set up the environment. And you talk about that in your book. Can you talk mm -hmm. about a little bit about environmental design and visual, visual cues for how that all works out? So I think this is a really important point you're bringing up, which is that... And I, I try to mention this at the end of the book. The holy grail of habit change is not a single 1% improvement. It's like a thousand of them. And so there is actually anybody who's saying like, oh, this is the one way to change your behavior. There is no one way. There are many ways. It's kind of like a toolbox. And the more tools that you have, sometimes it's best to use a hammer and sometimes it's best to use a wrench and sometimes it's best to use a screwdriver. But you have a variety of things that you can apply based on the habit that you're working on of circumstances you're dealing with. And the strategies are usually most powerful when they're used in combination with each other. So in this example, you've got the habit scorecard identified a good time to do it. You stack, used habit stacking to insert the behavior at the right time. You used environment design to prime the behavior to make the action as obvious and as easy as possible. And it's that combination of forces that make the habit much easier to build. Um, it's not necessarily one individual thing. So... Environment design, I think, is a very powerful way to change behavior. You know, one of the most overlooked drivers of our habits and behavior is the shape of the physical environment. The items on your desk at work, the things on your kitchen counter at home, the way your living room is laid out, like all of these things influence the actions and choices that we take. 
And I think the short way to summarize it, I love this phrase, which is that structure determines behavior. Structure determines behavior. So you walk back to your apartment or you go back to your house. You walk in through the door. You don't climb in through the window. (laughs) Why? Because the structure of that object determines the behavior that it's good for, right? And that is true for so many things in life. The way that the spaces are designed around us influences the action we take. So this is true, not just of your physical space, but also of your digital spaces. Like on my phone, when I wanted to read more consistently, I moved all the apps from the home screen, put them on the second screen. And then I took Audible and moved it into the home bar. So it was the first thing I'd see when I'd open up my phone. Now, individually, a bunch of little environment design changes like that don't radically change things. But collectively, they really start to nudge you in the right direction. It's much easier to take the right action when you're surrounded by an environment that's primed for it. So environment design is just the practice of making the good habit the path of least resistance. It's the path, uh, the practice of restructuring your environment so that the thing you want to do is really obvious, just like you keeping your supplements and vitamins like right next to the coffee maker, because then it's very easy to do. So the more that you can prime your environment for productive action, the better the odds are that you're going to follow through on that. I think that's... I mean, it's just priceless for people to start to think of their life this way instead of having it be so difficult to walk to my bathroom, get my supplements, come back. But what a point you made in the book that really was an aha moment for me and resonated with me was was about our devices. And you sort of mentioned put where you just talked about how you pushed everything that you didn't want to be looking at, whatever that was, news, ESPN, Google, Gmail, whatever, to your back, to your second screen. But in the book, you talked about how there... I believe it was like either a reader or or someone who followed along at jamesclear.com used different devices for different things. I think the hard part today is that we can jump on our phone and I can write a blog post on Squarespace. I can check... um, you know. Check in with like course email. I can check in with clients. I can jump into Instagram. I mean, it, the distractions and it's are just omnipresent, and it's very unclear what it's used for. Right. Habits there, and there have been a couple of studies that have shown this. Habits are generally easier if they're built in a new environment, and one of the reasons for that is that you don't already have like a behavioral bias to do things in that environment. So say, for example, that you wanted to start a habit of like, let's say journaling or something. And you're like, okay, I'm going to do that, you know, in the evening each night, I'll just like do that in the living room. Well, maybe it turns out that your couch is where you turn on Netflix at 7pm. And so when you sit down to start journaling, even without consciously thinking about it, you're kind of subconsciously pulled toward turning on the television and picking up the remote control because that's what usually happens. That's the habit that's already tied to that context. And so as much as possible, what you want to try to do is have what I say, like one space, one use, or you want to have a a habit that's directly tied to that context. So the example you mentioned, I, I have a friend who he's got his phone, his tablet and his desktop computer. And he tries to divide his behavior so that each type of thing happens on each device. So like his phone is what he uses to browse social media or to browse the web or whatever. His tablet is what he uses when he wants to read. So if he's you know reading a book or reading something on Kindle or whatever, or browsing an article, he does all that there. And then his desktop is where he does his writing. And um, by trying to make that as clear as possible, you can actually, you know, you can get rid of stuff. Like on the iPad, you just don't have any of the social media apps. Like it's not even possible in there. Um, or on the desktop, maybe he blocks twitter.com or whatever. So it becomes easier to do that. And what happens is that you get into the right headspace when you're in that context. It's kind of like um, I had another reader who he told me he was trying to write a book. And every time that he would go to the library, he would put his headphones on and turn on the same playlist. And one time he realized that he put his headphones on and forgot to press play, but he had already been writing for like 20 minutes. And the point is that when the context is the same every time, you get into this flow, you get into this zone where it's like a switch in your mind. And it's like, hey, this is what happens at this time and place. And your point about phones being like a very wild mix of things, you can, that is one of the upsides of the uh, smartphone or many of our devices is that they can do all kinds of things. But that's also one of the downsides because then it doesn't become clear 
I have my phone. Is this the place where I answer email or is this the place where I browse social media or is this where I watch videos on Instagram? Like what, what happens here? And uh, it's a, this blending of environments that makes it really hard to be productive because you also have a bunch of unproductive habits that happen on there. And that's fine. That doesn't mean you should never browse Instagram or whatever, but it just means that you should be clear about when and where those habits occur so that you can achieve the things that you want to achieve with greater consistency. So as much as possible, one space, one use is a a more effective way to try to design your habits. Also, I should say, you don't have to have entirely different rooms for something. Like, you know, some people are like, listen, I live in New York City where my apartment's the size of a shoebox. Like I can't, I don't have five rooms where I can do things. Well, you know, if you want to have like a reading habit, you could just get like a chair and put it in the corner of the room and that's the reading chair. And the only thing that happens there, you never touch your phone, you just read. And again, it becomes much easier to do those things when you have a dedicated space for them. Definitely. I read your book before we made a move recently, actually. And moving down to a new apartment, it's like a rental right now and we're looking to buy a house. But I... it almost triggered in my brain. I was like, this is amazing. Like we have the opportunity. You have a blank slate right here Mm. to not create those habits that you didn't love in your old space. Whether that was like working in a place where you read or bringing a television into your bedroom. And it does, it makes it so much easier for myself. And I know for my clients when, Hey, you want a better bedtime routine? Well, what's keeping you from going to bed? The TV in your room. We have to remove the TV from the room. You know, there's that friction of like not them not wanting to do that, but how much easier it would be for them not to have that in their room. Plugging your phone. It applies in so many ways. I mean, I we've had it happen uh, when we moved to a new neighborhood. Like the neighborhood we moved to was highly walkable. Guess what? We take a lot more walks now, Um, and it's just like it's just that it's it's quite obvious. Um, I had another very favorable thing that we stumbled into. I kind of like my my vice as a when it comes to nutrition is McDonald's French fries, which I just like <laughs> love. And the last place we lived, whenever we got off the highway to go to our neighborhood, there's a McDonald's right there. And so like I had to pass it to go home. And it got to the point where I was like, am I gonna stop here every time I get off the road? Like this is absurd. <laughs> and the the new neighborhood that we moved to doesn't have any McDonald's close by. I have not been, I don't think I've been this year. Uh it's it's just been months and months. And the only reason is because it's not obvious in the environment. It's not, it's not part of that. So I think there's a really big... I'm feeling this more now. I didn't, I, I didn't know this ahead of time. I just kind of stumbled into this insight. But there's this much bigger question about what is the environment of your neighborhood? Um, what is the environment of your home? And those things strongly influence your, your habits. You know, I mean, it's no wonder that people eat a lot of fast food when you pass 14 fast food restaurants on the way to your, uh, to your office every day. Like if it's part of the environment like that, it's much, much easier for you to fall into it. The same thing is true for good habits. There was a study that found that um, you're much less likely to go to the gym and work out even if the gym is only one block out of the way from your commute home. If it's on the path, you'll do it. But if it's even one block away, you're less likely to go. And so again, this comes down to friction and just making it the path of least resistance. So there are a lot of the ways in which that uh, that insight kind of bubbles up in our lives. Definitely. I've seen it so much with clients during COVID. You know, clients who've loved working out at a gym, the gyms are shutting down, they don't have access to this workout. And it's the clients that I've always had that have been consistent about 10, 15, 20 minute home workouts where you think, you know, they're jealous of the clients I have that have these awesome trainers and gym memberships. And now they're the ones who are consistent because it's so easy yeah. for them. They've created this habit. So there is there is something about making it super easy, bringing it into your home. So where I maybe wasn't recommending, hey, grab it, you know, sign up and get yourself a Peloton, get a Beachbody membership, like find a way to bring in some equipment into your home. But really it's that it's creating that environment, creating that space. And then allowing for that habit to be obvious, easy to do, satisfying, all the things you talk about when it comes to creating habits. It's great. Well, um, can you talk to me a little bit about um, t- the timing? Because you have something called the two-minute rule. And I heard you say even earlier talking about someone who wanted to start meditating. And I'm sure people listening like, have a cup of coffee, meditate for 60 seconds. are going like, 60 seconds? Only 60 seconds? Talk to me about timing and getting people just in the habit of doing something without a time restriction. 
Yeah. So I think if you can only remember one thing from this conversation, I feel like the two minute rule is the thing to remember because it can apply to pretty much any habit. So the two minute rule says, take whatever habit you're trying to build and you scale it down to something it takes two minutes or less to do. So read 30 books a year becomes read one page or meditate every day for the next three months becomes meditate for 60 seconds or do yoga four days a week becomes take out my yoga mat. And like you said, sometimes people resist it because they're like, okay, buddy, like I know the real goal isn't just to take my yoga mat out, right? I know I'm actually trying to do the workout. So if this is some kind of mental trick and I know it's a trick, then like, why would I fall for it basically? And I get where people are coming from, but I, I have this reader. His name's Mitch. I, I mentioned him in Atomic Habits. And he's lost over 100 pounds, kept it off for over a decade. And for the first six weeks that he went to the gym, he had this rule for himself where he wasn't allowed to stay for longer than five minutes. So he get in the car, drive to the gym, get out, do half an exercise, get back in the car, drive home. And it sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds silly. You're like, obviously, this is not going to get the guy the results that he wants. But if you take a step back, what you realize is that he was mastering the art of showing up, right? He was becoming the type of person that went to the gym four days a week, even if it was only for five minutes. And I think this is a much deeper truth about habits that often gets overlooked, which is a habit must be established before it can be improved, right? It has to become the standard in your life before you can optimize it and scale it up to something more. And for whatever reason, we get very all or nothing about our habits. We're like, if it's not the perfect business idea or the best workout plan or the ideal diet to follow, then we feel like I can't take action yet. I need to learn more. But the truth is, the best way to learn is often by taking action. And so you need to get over that hump. And I think the two minute rule helps you do that. It helps you show up. And it's almost always a better idea to do less than you had hoped than to do nothing at all. Um, and so the two minute rule kind of helps you get past that to avoid putting up a zero. So it's sort of this kind of like no zero days mentality. And on any given day, it doesn't count for a whole lot. In the long run, it can be really meaningful, even if it's small, you know, and it's true, not just for health and fitness, but for anything like the person who reads for an extra 10 minutes each day. Well, on any given day, reading for 10 minutes doesn't make you a genius. But over the course of 10 or 20 or 30 years, that can be a really meaningful difference in, uh, in insight and knowledge. And it, it adds up and compounds in a way that's surprising, uh, almost regardless of the domain that we're talking about. So I, I like the two-minute rule for that reason. It helps you master the art of showing up. I love it. I mean, you're really... And you're touching on perfectionism being the enemy of good, um, which is something that is so... It's It's something I see in our society with overachievers, with the clients that I have that have these amazing careers and they're VPs or they're actors or whatever. And and it it has to be the perfect day and the perfect workout and the exact, you know, sets and reps and or it's not really considered a workout. And and what you're really showing is that they can redefine good and and they can redefine what it means to get a workout in. It's that you showed up, it's that you did it. And that keeps you consistent because I think it's when we right. I mean, isn't it when we like go a couple weeks or a couple months, and then that energy that's needed to restart feels like way larger than it would ever be if you were just doing it for two minutes. Well, and the other thing that this addresses is that and I feel like this is the ultimate reason that habits matter. The real reason that they matter. We often talk about habits as being the pathway to external results, like. They'll help you lose weight or make more money or reduce stress. And it's true. Habits can do all that stuff and that's great. But the real reason that habits matter is that they give you a new narrative to tell yourself. They you know, reshape your self-esteem and the, the sense of self you have. They reinforce a new identity. And so the way that I like to phrase it is, every action you take is like a vote for the type of person you wish to become. And so these small choices, going to the to the gym for five minutes or, you know, like making one small healthy meal or writing one sentence or meditating for 60 seconds, no, they don't seem like they radically transform your life, but they do cast a vote for being that kind of person. Doing one push-up does not change your body, but it does cast a vote for I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. And writing one sentence does not finish the novel, but it does cast a vote for I'm a writer. And in the long run, true behavior change is really identity change. It's really learning to look at yourself in a new way 
And your habits, especially small habits that are done consistently, they keep casting these votes for being that kind of person. And eventually you build up a body of evidence. And it's, it's almost like any election, like you don't need a unanimous uh, decision to believe that about yourself. You just need a majority of the votes. And so the more that you show up and the more that you cast them, um, the more the weight of that story kind of shifts in your favor. And I almost feel like this is a little bit different than what you often hear, which is like, fake it till you make it. You know, fake it till you make it is asking you to... I don't necessarily have anything wrong with it. It's asking you to believe something positive. But it's asking you to believe something positive without having evidence for it. And we have a word for beliefs that don't have evidence. We call it delusion, right? Like your brain doesn't like this mismatch between what you're saying and what you're actually doing. And so my argument is both for external change and for internal change to just let the behavior lead the way. To start with meditating for 60 seconds or writing one sentence or doing one push-up and let that be undeniable evidence that in that moment, you were that kind of person. And um, I think in the long run, those short workouts, those things that seem insignificant, that don't satisfy the perfectionist inside of you, they actually count for a lot because you, the circumstances weren't ideal or it wasn't your best day, but you still cast a vote for the type of person you want to become. And that's really meaningful in the long run. I love that so much. And I think you even take it a step further in the book with the identity piece saying that the way that you talk about yourself or the way that you answer a question can say a lot about how you, th- who you think you are and what you identify with. I remember you using an example about a smoker. Can you explain how we should address, answer questions and be forward with our, who we want to be so that we can solidify that path? So I think uh, first I should say, I do feel like one question that comes before all of this is what do you really want? And I don't know that a lot of people really know that, you know, like you need to have a good answer for who do you want to become? What do you want to stand for? What's important to you? So that's an important question to wrestle with. But assuming that you have a good response to that, or you're, you're fairly clear on what you want to achieve. Yeah, there's this example that I give where it's like, say you have two people and you go up to one of them and you offer them a cigarette and they say, oh, no, thanks. I'm trying to quit. And then you go up to a second person and you offer them the same cigarette and they say, oh, no, thanks. I'm not a smoker. Now, it's the same behavior. They're both declining the cigarette. But the second person is at a very different place than the first. The first person is trying to be something they're not. Oh, no, thanks. I'm trying to quit. The other person is... They already identify as I am not a smoker. And so they're not even really doing a behavior that is different than the way that they self-identify, the way that they define themselves. And I think that's when you kind of see this real shift in long-term behavior change. The story has shifted. The way that you feel is different. You're not even really pursuing behavior change anymore. You're just acting in alignment with the type of person you see yourself to be. And so that, I think, is ultimately where we want to get to. And I really feel like it's possible to do it with kind of that epiphany sort of thing, what I was mentioning earlier in the conversation about like seeing a loaf of bread and changing your story about that. It's possible to do it that way. I think it's harder. I think it's harder to predict it. I think it's harder to just flip a switch and think about life differently. I think the more realistic way to do it is to show up each day, to build a small habit, and to let that be evidence and cast those votes. You know, it's kind of like if you study biology every Tuesday night for 20 minutes, well, the first day you do it, or the third day you do it, or the eighth day you do it, you don't really think a whole lot about it. But if you keep doing it, at some point, you have to admit yourself, I'm kind of studious. Like that's part of my identity. And it works like that for almost any habit. The more that you keep showing up, at some point you have to admit, yeah, this is part of who I am. Um, And so I think that's the ultimate way to approach behavior change. I love it. Pairing identity with action is, I think, really, really important. I I see it with clients in my practice who want to embrace body love. You know, they could, I've said this on other podcast before, but they could be a size two or a size 22. And unless they're like doing the action of taking care of themselves and loving on their body through these actions, through these habits, whether it's drinking water, moving their body, having one healthy meal, it's not a perfect day, but it's that it's those votes you're talking about because self-love and body love and all of that has everything to do with like how you're showing up for yourself. And that's in the action, right? There's also um, one of the most motivating feelings to the human mind is the feeling of progress. And so even if you are far from where you hope to be in the long run, if you're making progress, that feels great. 
And so casting votes is a way to feel that. Building better habits is a way to feel that, even if it's a small thing on any given day. And you can use that momentum to carry you into the next day. Because one of these, one of the challenging things about a lot of these changes is that they're battles that have to be fought anew each day. You know, like your your last your next workout doesn't care how good your last one was. You know, your your next meal doesn't care how healthy your last one was. And so you have to show up and keep fighting this battle day in and day out, building this lifestyle. And um, I think any small signal of progress that you can get feeds and fuels that so that you have some momentum to go into the next battle feeling good, feeling fresh, feeling like you're moving forward. Which is why your tools of making a habit, making it obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying helps us. Because if, if you know our workout today doesn't care about yesterday, it's starting fresh. It's getting out there. It's saying yes and doing it every single day, which is so powerful. I have just a couple more questions before we end today. It's has been just like already so amazing. I'm so excited to get this out there and to get people just using those little things to make it easy so they can change their life. But I think one thing that stand, stood out to me in your book was the difference between motion and action. Because I think there is, there is a lot of times when when people can get stuck in motion and feel like it's progress, but not really be making any. Can you explain what the difference between those two are and how do we step out of motion and into action? So the, the way that I define it is that motion are, uh, motion is the category of things that you do often in preparation to get things done. Action is the category of things that can actually get you a result. So for example... It doesn't matter how many times you go to the gym and talk to a personal trainer, you will never get in shape from talking to a personal trainer. Um, but if you get under the bar and do 10 squats, that actually could get you the result that you're looking for. And so doing squats is action, talking to a trainer is motion. Now, a lot of times people resist this a little bit, partially because of what you mentioned. It's like, well, I, like, I need to plan to do this well, or I, you know, I need to have a good strategy or whatever. And that's true. You know, planning isn't necessarily always a bad thing. But when planning becomes its own form of procrastination, you're kind of trapped in this like motion loop where, again, like I said earlier, a lot of the times people feel like, oh, I can't take action yet. I need to learn more. But actually, the best way to learn is often by taking action. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think we use motion as like a safety uh, valve, as like a security blanket where we're like... Uh, imagine you, you know, you've had a dream of starting your own business. And so you're like, Oh, man, I would really love to do this. And so you spend the weekends or you spend the nights dreaming up business names or working on a design for a logo or like looking around for getting business cards. And the truth is, it doesn't matter how many times you come up with a name or get business cards or design a logo, you don't have a business. The thing that you need is something to sell and somebody who buy it. And those are the only two things that matter in the beginning. And so those two things are action, everything else is motion. And again, people are like, well, yeah, but the name matters and like your logo matters and whatever. And it's like, well, maybe to a certain degree, but not very much. And uh, I think we do those things because we are scared of failure. And it's a way to work on the project without running the risk of failure. You're never going to fail at designing a logo or fail at brainstorming business names. But you might fail at reaching out to a client or making a sales call and being turned down. And uh, the same thing is true for you're never going to fail having a conversation with a personal trainer, uh, but you might fail getting under the bar and trying to do a squat. And so realizing that we use those things as a crutch, I think is important uh, so that you can start to transition past that and get yourself to take an action. And this is, again, I think is another reason why small habits are so helpful. Scale it down so that it's small enough that it's not intimidating. Scale it down so that it's small enough that failure is not going to wreck you. And that's true not only in like a, an actual physical sense, like failure won't hurt you or you're you know, running a risk where you wouldn't survive, or a financial sense where like failure would make you bankrupt or something. But I think it also applies in a psychological sense. You know, like fail so that you can handle it. And if you are willing to take a real action and run the risk of even a small failure, that will make you stronger. You'll learn something. And then you can use that to go into the next trial or the next round and do it all over again and just kind of gradually gain a little foothold to advance to the next level. But that type of trial and error only works if you're actually performing actions, which can get the result you desire and not trapped in motions, which will never actually deliver the thing you're trying to achieve. 
So true. And your example resonates so much for me because I have a couple of mentor or mentees every single year that I mentor in their own private nutrition practice. And it's so often that they're reading the studies and looking at blood tests and building their website and coming out with their business cards. And I'm like, I know it's scary. You're going to work with a client. You're not going to have all the answers. You may not know their disease state. You can do the research. You have all the ability to do that. But it's so scary to worry about how is that person going to perceive me? How am I going to get to work with them? And it's like, everything comes out of that actual work of maybe not having the right answers at the right time and saying, I have to go back and do a little research, but it's, it's made your book required reading for all my mentees because it's so often that I see people in motion and not in action because it is scary. You're right. It's so scary to put yourself out there and to worry about like falling on your face, but it's the only way to get going. It's also like learning to solve problems in the right order. You know, like if you if you're not working out right now, the problem is figuring out how to get in the gym consistently. So solve that problem first. I love that um there's that quote from Ed Lattimore where he says the heaviest weight of the gym is the front door. And so like <laughs> that's the that's the problem right now. You need to get in there consistently, even if it's only for like that example I gave a few minutes ago. If it's only for 5 minutes. Now, after you're showing up and doing it consistently, then maybe the next problem is, am I using the right technique? Or am I doing the right exercises? Am I not wasting my time here? But that actually, you don't need to read every exercise book before you go to the gym for the first time because you're not even going consistently to begin with. So solve the problems in the right order. Figure out how to show up consistently, then figure out how to spend the time in an effective way and on and on and on. But a lot of the time, people try to optimize before they standardize. They try to optimize before it becomes the standard or normal behavior in their life. And um, you want to make sure you get that sequence right. I love it. Standardize before you optimize. Oh, I I feel like I could talk to you all day. And obviously, I am just obsessed with what you put out because it's just real. It's real life. It's not perfection. It's not biohacking. It's not, you know, figuring out exactly what works perfect for you. It's it's doing the action. It's getting going. It's getting consistent. It's making it easy. It's making it obvious. Um, because I think we're all just sort of lazy and want to watch Netflix anyways. Right? <laughs> the days are hard. The years are long. And if you're a sleep-deprived parent, it's even worse. So, <laughs> so it's just... God, it's been such an absolute pleasure. And I just think everyone should read your book. But before we go out, I want to touch on how we can make our habits last because all of these habits, all of the tools you've given us to create habits and break habits and stack habits and you know, design our perfect house with the gym in one corner and the reading nook in the other, it's all like it just makes me really excited about thinking about how to design a house and how to create that life and, and stack things because we don't, they can be easy and you're proving that. How do we make it last? It's a great question. And I think, uh, let me give two answers. So the first answer, I would say, you know, we can just summarize some of the tactical and strategic things we've gone over so far. So starting with the habit scorecard and becoming more aware of your current habits. Once you're aware of them and you have like a better idea of how you can change things or sorry, of what you want to change, you can start to actually make changes by using like habit stacking, layering in a simple habit uh, at some, you know, at the strategic time. I find that great to be used in combination with the two-minute rule. So scale your habit down first. Find a two-minute version that you can make a habit stack out of. That's usually a pretty effective method. Using environment design to kind of prime the environment for productive action and layering that in with the habit stacking thing. So you have a very clear place where this small habit lives and it happens in an environment that's uh, organized around achieving that goal. So those strategies are all very effective at getting habits to start. If you want habits to stick, if you want them to last, like you just asked, I think one of the key things is the social environment. And this is an element that I have realized is even more important than I knew when I was writing the book. So I have a chapter on on this. I think it's chapter 10, which is the, the importance of family and friends on your habits. But since the book has come out, I think this plays an even bigger role than I realized. So many of our habits and behaviors are a product of the tribes or of the groups that we're a part of. And we all are part of multiple tribes. Some of them are really big, like what it means to be American or what it means to be French or whatever. Some of them are small, like what it means to be a neighbor on your street or a member of the local CrossFit gym or a volunteer at the elementary school. And all of these groups 
they have a set of shared habits, a set of shared norms for how people act. So like, let's take the neighborhood one. You might move into a new street, uh, move on to move into a new house and you walk out on your street and you see your neighbor is like mowing his lawn and you think, oh, I need to cut the grass. And you might stick to that habit for 30 years or however long you stay in that house. Like we wish we had that level of consistency with our other habits. And the main reason that you do it, partially, it feels good to have a clean lawn, but mostly it feels good to have a clean lawn because you don't want to be judged by the other people in the neighborhood for being sloppy. And so it's actually that norm, that social expectation that drives the habit. And this is true in so many different areas. You join a tribe and you start to soak up, you start to build friendships there, you start to care about the people's opinions there, and you start to soak up the other behaviors. Like People will join a CrossFit gym and six months later, they're eating paleo and buying a certain brand of knee sleeves and have like special weightlifting shoes. And like they never wanted to do any of those things, but it's the norm in that group. And so they soak up the habits of their tribe. So I think the lesson, the practical takeaway, if you really want a habit to last, is you want to join groups, to join tribes where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. Because if it's normal in that group, it's going to be very attractive for you and natural for you to stick with it in the long run. It's going to feel like you fit in with the group. Our behaviors are not things that we do only because they serve us. We also do them because they're a signal to the people that are around us, that we fit in, that we belong, that we get it. And most people, if they have to choose between, I get to have the habits that I want, but I don't really fit in. I'm kind of cast out from the crowd. Or I have habits that I don't love, but I get to fit in, I belong. Most people will choose belonging over loneliness. Most people will choose the desire to belong, which will overpower the desire to improve. And the good news, of course, is that you don't have to choose between the two, but you may need to work and put some effort in to get them aligned. And so ultimately, you want to join groups where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. And if you want habits to last, especially for a decade or two or three, I think those strategies we talked about can help get you started and the social environment can help keep it on track. So true. I feel like some of the biggest hurdles and challenges I have with getting a client to change would be that all their girlfriends love to drink wine and they don't really want to drink wine, but they really want to go to the dinner. And the dinner's on a Tuesday. It's not even on a Friday. And so then they're drinking early in the week. And it definitely, those are the hurdles. And like the mother in law that drops off the apple pie every Sunday because she loves to bake. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not trying to make other people feel uncomfortable and not trying to go against your tribe, but really sticking with what are your goals and, and how can we make sustainable change? So you're giving people the tools to get everything going and then hopefully they can go inspire their environment or their tribe, their social tribe. So. I really, really appreciate your time, James. This has been just awesome. I, I'm sure everyone can like feel my smile through the Zoom call right now because it's just such good stuff. Just really applicable, really, really just tools, real, real actionable tools that can change people's lives. And we need more people like you. I really appreciate your time. Where can people follow along? Where can they sign up for your newsletter, buy your book, all the things? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think the best place to go if you enjoyed this conversation is to check out Atomic Habits. So you can go find out the book or find more about the book at atomichabits.com. And if you're interested in getting more from me or kind of checking out my work in, in more detail, you can go to jamesclear.com. If you click on articles, you, they're organized by category. So you can kind of check out what's interesting to you. And um, the most popular thing that I produce is the weekly newsletter. And uh, that's at jamesclear.com slash newsletter. So feel free to check those out and see what interests you. Definitely sign up for the newsletter. It's really good. All right, guys. Thanks for joining. We'll be back next week with another podcast. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 